Hi everyone, my name is Hesse Jones and welcome to Tech Uncensored. This is the third and final day at Collision. And I always say the third day we, we reserve for the best and the last. <laughs> so I'm here um, talking to Kabir Bardet, who is the CEO of OneTrust. And uh, we're going to be talking accountability, we're going to be talking trust, we're going to be talking responsibility, especially in this uh, age of LLMs and AI. So welcome. Yeah. Let's do it. Thanks for having me. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So why don't you tell us a little bit about OneTrust and especially the milestones that you've recently hit. Yeah. yeah. At OneTrust, we've pioneered a new category of software around the responsible use of data in AI and everything it takes to, to do that. And that includes transparently collecting data, simplifying all the compliance automation of all the different regulations of that data, and then uh, enforcing the policies when you're using the data. And so we've built a platform around that. We've grown incredibly quickly over the last uh, many years, first fueled by privacy regulations and now uh, AI. We have, uh, we're approaching 500 million of ARR is the recent announcement. We, we made 14,000 customers all over the world. Um, those are some of the recent milestones. Great, so it looks like Privacy is good for your business, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, from your perspective, privacy is good for the world. Privacy is good for the world, yeah. but for a long time, privacy flew under the radar, yeah. as you know. Yeah. And um, a lot of companies were doing amazing things, they were innovating, yeah. but privacy was a start, uh, a, I would say, a hurdle or a stopping block for many companies. Yeah. So, we are reaching a phase, it's almost a dichotomy between speed of innovation, and also responsible technology. Can you speak a little bit about how you've seen that shift yeah. over the number of years? Yeah, it's been interesting. When we work with companies, so our product helps companies manage risk and use data. And so you want to bridge those gaps. Um, but the challenge in the market is that there, there are almost sometimes two sides to that equation. When I meet with companies, there are business teams, marketing, data, people trying to use more data. Their jobs depend on innovating and using more data. And then you have all these risk teams, privacy, security, ethics, legal. It's like eight different risk teams now. Their job depends on supporting the business, but also minimizing risk. And all of these teams are under pressure now because of these new demands. Um, and that pressure sometimes even puts those teams at odds. The good news is there is a common goal and a common question that is bringing these teams together and it's how do we future-proof our data across all these risk angles we care about at the speed and volume demanded by our data and AI initiatives. Um, and we're seeing those teams coming together but needing something new to help bridge that gap and, and that's the gap we solve with our software. Okay. So we spoke earlier offline about the need for marketers. Yeah. Or, I wouldn't say the need for marketers, but may, maybe marketers realizing yeah. that there is a need to to look at privacy in a different way. Yeah. Because the industry, advertising industry marketers have been known to target and maybe they haven't used it in the best yeah. way. I have to say that when they're doing it, they're doing it with the best intentions. They're trying right. to find increased revenue, relevant customers, but sometimes the targeting that they're using are using variables that are not necessarily stuff that should, they should have access to. So right. what, what's your perspective on the, the common day marketer yeah. and why there is a need to be, I would say, more responsible? Yeah, I, I love the question and, it, and it's so in tune to the moment because almost every company I meet with now, three, four years ago, I'd show up and it would be the privacy and the legal team in the room. And now it's the marketing and the data team in every meeting leading the privacy charge. And what we're seeing is that every marketing team is really going through three phases. First, it's regulatory compliance. Second, it's first party data capture. And third, it's AI enablement. When you start in that first phase of regulatory compliance, these marketing teams are really thinking about cookie and cookie compliance because that's the first thing a regulator is going to enforce. So great, that's usually where they start. But, but we know that's just the tip of the iceberg and there, there's still lots of, of um, uh, uh, t techniques that are being worked out in that world. But where companies are shifting to, marketing teams are seeing reliance on third party data is not the future. For them. It's got to be first party data. Your ability to capture first party data is directly proportionate to the trust you have with your customers. And that trust is activated through 
privacy and choice and control and transparency. So companies are deploying these, te these um, technologies around consent and preference games were very well known and widely used for that as well. That's kind of the second phase. Now the third phase is new with AI. And what marketing teams are realizing with AI is it's driving a whole new urgency, to your point. And that's because there is no machine on learning. When you put data in to a machine learning algorithm, the data loss has happened, the issues have happened. You can't selectively remove it. That's different from a previous CDP or personalization project where you can just delete the data from that environment. And regulators have found this out. When I meet with regulators now, they're shifting their tool of choice from a fine to a data deletion and now an algorithmic deletion order. Because the only repercussion, the only way to solve an issue in machine learning, deleting the data doesn't help. The machine learning algorithm already learned it. You gotta delete the algorithm. And so marketing teams are seeing this existential issue to their marketing campaigns and trying to lay the foundation up front. And what's happening is because global laws are everywhere now, there's a common playing field that everyone needs to comply. And so now you can differentiate with privacy. In the past, when it was only certain states or certain countries with laws, and it wasn't a level playing field, it was a problem. And there's a second interesting concept, which is this is why most companies now are lobbying for privacy laws, not against it. Because it's not fair for a Microsoft that they gotta comply with all these global laws and then some local company in the US doesn't. So like Microsoft is lobbying for privacy law. And so it's really driving this interesting trend where if you can't beat them, you join them. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I want to um, address a couple of things. So first, first off, um, you mentioned consent. Yeah. And everybody would argue that in the age of advanced artificial intelligence, that consent has gone out the door. Yeah. We are now seeing a prevalence of data scraping there is no consent for data scraping. There is no consent for data brokerages. And there's no provenance for wh when yeah. that data was actually received. So there are companies that are saying, maybe we go out there and we become the proxy for the consent mechanism so that the uh, consumer doesn't have to worry about where their data is and where they can control it. Because from their perspective, there is no more control. So yeah. I want your perspective on that. Yeah, there, there's there's a lot of different concepts here. I think this is an area where we're going to see a lot of interesting new business models and innovation. You know, there have been companies that have tried to innovate in this model where you have a um, almost a personal data vault for a consumer. They put all their data in it, and then people, those have been around for 10 years, and those businesses have gone nowhere. Now, will that change with AI? I think there are fundamental issues with that model, and there are issues with how that, that um, companies compete with each other and if one company is um, these problems are um, very in your face with ch uh, child consent as well it's like if you consent to use a service for company a then company b their direct competitor gets that consent for free and it's not you know so there are competitive issues and things that are preventing that market from from surfacing now more broadly um, what companies are starting to realize is any data they have, whether it's scraped, whether it's collected first party, or whether it's from a third party, there's a new level of governance they need on that data. And that new level of governance is a purpose-specific attribute on the data. It used to be that the industry used to talk about what's called data access governance, which just has to do with, is the data sensitive and who needs to access it? Now there's a third dimension, and it's, do you have permission to use it for that purpose? And this is really overhauling how companies are thinking about data governance to embed purpose specification in their data. So now, if a company goes and scrapes a bunch of data online, um, the question for that company is, what that data you collected, how was the consumers of that data able to give you a purpose specification? And what documentation do you have that proves you have the right legal basis to have that? This is something that companies are taking risks on today. And if they get that risk, and look, all companies take risks, whether that's a smart risk to take or not a smart risk to take, is not for me to say right now. But what I would say is if a company gets that wrong, the repercussions are dramatic and are gonna be seen in the next few years because the repercussions of data deletion order. Imagine if OpenAI has an enforcement action on one small thing they scraped that violates a regulation a tiny mistake that they make, a regulator can do a data deletion order on their entire algorithm. That pretty much shuts down the entire 
general purpose LLM. My prediction is that's going to happen in the next few years, and we're going to see significant disruption. Now, I don't think that's going to slow down companies' ability to use enterprise LLMs with their own proprietary data sets. I think that's the future. It's companies that have proprietary, purpose-specific, consent-based data sets are going to win, and companies that are doing things that don't really have the right intellectual property, copyright, consent, permissions, you're one data deletion and one algorithmic deletion order away from being shut down. It's going to happen. It's, it seems like you're saying companies like, I would say, Cohere, Claude, uh, Anthropic, OpenAI, um, that are creating a lot of these general models, they're probably the ones more at risk than the ones that are, than the companies that are actually using the, the model to create submodels. Is that right? I th um, you know, I, th I think I think so, right? Because. The differentiation in AI, number one, comes from proprietary, not, not the model itself. These models are going to be everywhere, available, open source. So who has the most proprietary data? This is also interesting because um, privacy law and AI law is going to start overlapping with competition law. Because companies that have the most data set, the, the, the companies that have the best relationships with the first party consumer are going to be able to collect purpose-specific, consent-based data the best. And they're the only ones that are going to be collected. And when these enforcement actions happen and the people that are collecting it illegally versus not collecting it, you have the haves and the have-nots. Well, who are the big companies that have the most first-party data relationships? You could probably think of a few big platform companies that start to now have competition issues. So data is not just an ethical issue, a security issue, uh, a fairness issue, and a consent issue, but it's now a competition issue as well. And I don't even think we're scratching the surface yet on how hairy of a problem this is going to emerge. But it gets back to the point of your, your original question, which is what are companies doing today? And companies are doing today are realizing, and marketers are realizing today, that proprietary first party data directly from their customers is the gold. And trust is the currency that allows you to exchange. And so, yeah, marketing teams, data teams, everybody's now upping their game and looking at Privacy as a differentiator, not as a regulatory compliance issue. That is so good to hear. Yeah. I mean, I've seen ever since the evolution of the privacy commissioner telling Facebook yeah. they got to change their their uh, privacy system in order for Canadians to actually go onto that platform. I think that was circa 2008 yeah. or 2010. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's actually changed so much since then. So yeah. thank you for that. Yeah. Okay, so let's shift gears a little bit. Let's talk about DORA, yeah. the Digital Operational Resilience Act. Yeah. Can you, I guess in layman's terms, introduce what does that mean for financial institutions yeah. and their vendors? Yeah, um, so, so um, DORA is uh, an act around um, d digital operational resilience. I think originated out of, out of Europe and applies to financial institutions, but the people interacting with financial institutions that end up getting in scope indirectly. Um, this is one of the biggest demands around uh, ultimately third-party management that we're seeing with companies. Um, a lot of a company's ability to be resilient operationally has to do with who are all your third parties, who are all your suppliers, and do you have some sort of do you have issues with that? Um, if there are geopolitical issues in a certain region, if there are um, even climate change issues that put a data center uh, at, at risk, but even just security and privacy issues in that supply chain, one of those entities goes down, what's your ability to stay in business? I mean, we learned this in the pandemic when businesses were shut down. Dora takes it a step further, rightfully so, in saying it's not just to direct vendors, but it's the fourth parties as well. What starts to happen is you have a lot of vendors that, let's say a technology vendor that you're using, maybe all of them are using the same backend cloud data or security provider. You end up having a hidden concentration risk at a fourth party that now Dora is trying to bring forward. So those are some of the concepts in, in Dora. Now, more broadly, um, how this relates back to our AI topic is also interesting because most of a company's AI exposure, when I meet with companies today, they'll say, I have two or three, yeah, really big, really important AI projects, but we have our arms around it, we haven't gone live with them yet, and so our exposure is limited. What they really start to realize is they have a thousand plus AI projects happening at their company that they don't realize is happening. It's coming through your software supply chain. The difference with AI versus the internet or mobile as a, as, a, as a new technology trend is internet and mobile took many years for 
technology companies to re-platform on a new thing. AI is an API call. It took us a week to integrate AI into our application. So now you have a, th and it's not a new vendor I signed on. It's just, it's, it's, it's the existing vendor for the company. So now you have thousands of vendors that just built an AI into their product and are pumped into the supply chain into all these companies. And the difference is those vendors are being used directly by line of business. It's like shadow IT. And those line of businesses are putting data into it that is a completely new angle that companies have no control over. So third party management, not just Dora, but third party management in general is a massive, massive trend right now when it comes to responsible data and AI. And it's an area we excel at. I'm just wondering, um, because of that, to what extent, to what extent is the, it, are you liable, uh, the first party company, to the breaches or the mishaps that happen at the nth line? Yeah, so, so um, I'm a technologist, not, not a lawyer, but I do um, uh, study these issues pretty heavily. Now, um, it depends. More broadly, this was one of the big shifts in GDPR. So GDPR holds the controller, which is the company that's collecting and, and having that data, that, that responsible. So me as a company, I am responsible for what my vendors do. Now, if I want to shift that liability back to my vendors, I can try to do some of that in my contract with my vendor, but the regulation supersedes that and still holds me accountable. So I can try to say, hey, if I get in trouble, I'm going to try to put a $5 million liability clause in my contract with my vendor, and I'm going to try to reclaim that from them. The regulator's still coming after me. My name's still going to be in the news. And if I want to drag my vendor through the mud, I can choose to do that or not. But the accountability is now on that, on that first party. That's driving a new level. You use the word accountability to start. That's driving accountability. And a lot of these new regulations are really accountability-based regulation. And they're trying to make the accountability clear. And they're trying to say, you don't just need accountability, but you need to have the right people in your company accountable in the right org chart where they can be accountable. And, and GDPR and privacy even goes as far as being prescriptive in some of that. I, I would love to speak to you more. Yeah. I'm, I'm getting the, you, you got to get out of here. Signal, Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to thank you yeah. so much for speaking to yeah, me. I think fun, yeah. what we're probably going to speak a little bit more offline because yeah. I want more information from you. Uh, so everyone, thank you uh, for uh, joining us in this conversation. Uh, everyone enjoy the rest of Collision. And this is Hessie Jones for Tech Uncensored.